He's at Packard's Inn. He talks to Packard, talks to some of the bandits. He gets to know them. In fact, he might recognize a few of them later in the campaign because the bad guys hire from there too. So it'd be kind of funny or interesting that after our battle, you know, he recognizes a few of them. Hello, welcome back to the Three Orcs channel. This is David, and today we're going to talk about the fighter character in my Temple of Elemental Evil campaign. His name is Vigon, and I have a player in the group that wanted to play just a straight fighter. Uh, the group needed it because um, they had a lot of reigns and spellcasters in the party, and they needed somebody to stand up to the enemy to be able to give the a party a chance to uh, give them op the opportunity to do something. Because if you have a room of 30 goblins and they swarm the party coming down the tunnel, you need somebody to stand up to them to give time for the rest of the party to do something. If there's nobody up front to buy time for the party, they're going to be swarmed and the combat will be over within a round or two. The player that wanted to play the fighter, he's fairly new to the game, which is a modern version of AD&D called Castles and Crusades. Basically, it's the same thing as AD&D, except they uh, cleared it up, they clarified it, they reformatted it. And the only difference is they added this unique, eloquent way of, of handling actions and skills in the game. Because there's no skills list. Basically, you're role-playing, and whatever you do, the Dungeon Master has to make a call. And that call is usually pointed towards one of the attribute stats, like if it's a strength check or a dexterity check. But... In this game, you're not supposed to make a skill check unless there's a high chance of failure to you make the roll. Generally, it's kind of a joke where if the Dungeon Master is making you call for a skill check, you pretty much failed already. Because often, if you role play well enough and present yourself well enough and you tackle the problem, the Dungeon Master will usually let you have it. He'll say, okay, you succeeded in that and continue on with the game. But if there's a critical chance of failure, then that Dungeon Master should call a skill check to see, to give that random chance whether or not you make it or not you know if you jump up and grab the tree and pull yourself up out of the way of the charging horse or try to swim across the river or something like that but if it's a more mundane function of your character class and your race and the equipment that you have and your experience then you're really going to have to roll so this new player um, he's new to that. He came from 5e, and so I had to teach him, you know, the basics of role-playing the old-fashioned way, which is more theater of the mind. And I referred to a lot of the points they make in the old-school primer that you can find online. We both decided that the new player would benefit from just being a fighter, so that way he can focus on the game rather than all these different spells and abilities. And then I pointed out to him that he doesn't have to be just a fighter. In the role-playing videos I made before this, I do mention that I could make 10 fighters and every one of them will be completely different because of my seven things. Um, it would be dependent on your race, your class, um, the style of clothes you're wearing, the color and style, um, the kind of armor you're wearing, the kind of weapons you have or the, the way you use those weapons, your background, how you were raised, uh, any kind of specialized equipment that you have, how you present yourself, how you role play, how you talk. Um, like for example, we'll take a base cleric. You know, people think, you know, cleric's a cleric. You know, they cast spells and they heal the party. Well, in more modern versions or newer versions of role-playing games, um, they have all these subclasses to give the players a false sense of choice. Um, basically, they just quit, create a, the base class and they just break it down to something unique with a unique description and some artwork. And they'll provide, they'll add like some feats and skills to that to give, make them feel special. But in old school D&D, you can do the same thing. You just need to do those seven things I mentioned. You know, how you look, how you present yourself, the equipment you will use, how you talk, um, the kind of clothes, the style you wear. So an example is you have a base cleric. Well, what if you want to play an inquisitor? Well, an inquisitor has a certain way of speaking, right? They have certain kind of clothes they're wearing. They have certain symbols of the organization they belong to, the god that they worship, and uh, they have this attitude. And also the kind of weapons they choose to use in performing their duties, why they're adventuring. All that can be, they can call themselves an inquisitor. When, they, when they're role playing with other players at the table and the NPCs in the campaign, they can introduce themselves and behave as an inquisitor so in effect, they're an inquisitor class. It's just in more modern games, they actually created that subclass using um, and throwing a bunch of skills together to give that, a, a player an idea of what they are. And I, and I see why that would be helpful for new players. 
because newer players really don't know how to play very well. They can't really think outside the box. They can't come up with these things on their own. And so when they see a character class already created for them, it goes, yeah, I want to play that. That sounds like a great character. I'm going to play that guy. And, and, that, and the game does it for them. Where in old school D&D, you have to use your imagination to come up with your own character. And you can be anything you want. You don't have to be just the, I don't know, 100 different classes they have in the modern games. You can have a choice between a 1,000 different characters. It just takes imagination. And if you don't have any imagination, you can get resources online. Just go on the internet and find out all sorts of things. Um, or, or read a book. A fantasy book will give you some fantastic ideas of characters in the book that you could actually imitate or modify and use it in a campaign. D&D had a huge impact on my life. I started playing in grade school after Star Wars came out in 1977, where I started a gaming club that led to D&D. At the time, I would be found in a classroom, keeping my head low, buried in a fantasy book. The D&D blue box set changed and consumed my life. Quickly after that, I bought the AD&D Player's Handbook by Gary Gygax, which had a massive influence on me. I highly recommend these books to read. Rise of the Dungeon Master, Gary Gygax and the Creation of D&D by David Kushner and Corin Sadmi. This graphic novel is a quick read, and it is a brief glimpse into the life of Gary Gygax, the creation of D&D, the controversy, and the effects that the game had on pop culture and many lives that it touched. The next book is Empire of Imagination, Gary Gygax and the Birth of Dungeons and Dragons by Michael Whitwer. I found that this biography is a series of fictional vignettes about events in Gary Gygax's life, loosely connected by nods at context, which is more of an inspired by true events story than an actual biography. And the last one is Of Dice and Men, the story of Dungeons and Dragons and the people who play it by David Ewalt. This was a fun read about the history of Dungeons & Dragons. The author injects that some scenes from one of his own D&D campaign, which, is, which I liked, but sometimes it strayed a, bit, a little bit too far from the subject and covered a lot other role-playing games. I was really happy to identify with a lot of the scenes in this book, and not just from playing the game. You can find my affiliate links down below. All right, so back to the fighter. So my fighter... He wanted to be something, I, I wanted to give him some choices. You know, he had trouble. He doesn't know the world of Greyhawk like I do. Um, he's aware of the, of the World Anvil website that I created, over 1,500 pages of lore in the area. And he knew, I told him, that the campaign is happening in the Vi County of Verbabank. I said, well, you can be from Verbabank or the city or any of the countries around. Or maybe one of the geographical areas like the Nauti Forest or the Cron Hills or the Lord Mill Mountains. And it can be any race you want. So you wanted to keep it simple and be human because that could be easy for him to role play. Like, okay, well, let's, okay, let's think about something here. Let's, let's get a little creative. What kind of fighter do you want to be? Well, okay, to help you, what kind of weapons do you like to use? Do you like to go around with a two-handed sword and swing away? Uh, do you want to be a standard sword and board with a shield and a, and a sword? and fight like a, like a standard fighter. Um, do you want two weapons? Do you want a Florentine style? Or you want a rapier? Do you want to be more dexterous? And you want, that's your fighting style. You know, you have duels and stuff. So you gotta remember, this is just a fighter class in old school D&D. It still can be a duelist. You know, you don't have to play a modern game to be a duelist. You just gotta role play it and choose the right weapons and equipment. So if I was to play a duel, if, make a duelist in old school D&D, you'd have the rapier or something like that. There's a lot of weapons, finesse weapons that you can choose. Um, you could use an off buckler. You could use that dagger that you could use for parrying and tacking at the same time. I forgot what it was called, sorry. Um, and you can use lighter armor because that'll give you more mobility so you're not weighed down. Because the big plate wearer, wear, the, the big tanks in the group, the plate wearers will most likely be um, encumbered. And they won't move as fast, but you want to be able to move quickly. And also that whole thing about I want to jump from this to that or jump off this or swing from that. Uh, I take that into effect uh, depending on the armor you're wearing. If you want to swim across that river or dive into the lake, you know, things like that come up in the campaign and it makes a difference. So you have to, you know, a good DM can bring all of those factors into play. Uh, they give the players legitimate reasons why they bought that bedroll why they have a backpack, uh, why they have that kind of armor on. Um, and then, of course, he can choose um, what kind of guy he is, you know, how he talks, how he presents. So we talked about that. What kind of fighter do you want to be besides the kind of fighting style do you want? Well, okay. Um, well, I've got some ideas maybe. This will, you know, 
we'll come up with this together. Uh, maybe you're, you're a caravan guard. Maybe you, um, your father was a caravan guard or a merchant, and you traveled with the caravan across, you know, the Flaness from Greyhawk to uh, Valuna to, uh, for, you know, Valuna to, up to Ferrandi. And, and that's way in maybe your father was killed in some raid by bandits, or maybe he's still out there. I hate that when all the everybody's parents are always killed as a backstory. But anyway, he has those choices, right? He, so he could be a caravan guard, and he had that mannerism, the, the way he acts and talks. So maybe that gives him an opportunity to learn, be more cultured in the different countries because he's been there. You know, he's been to City of Greyhawk. He's been to Valuna. You know, he, he's done trade with all merchants with different languages, from Beclunas to Flan to um, the Ardi. And... Uh, and a soul. And so, and, and the kind of weapons he uses, you know, what kind of, what kind of weapons do uh, caravan guards typically use? So that's kind of like how his mannerism, the way, and, and then he has a reason why he wants to go adventuring. So we have to come up with that too. Uh, another type of fighter could be on a ship, a, mer a merchant ship on the river or the lake or the, or the ocean. So that means he's a swashbuckler or a pirate kind of guy, depending on his background, right? His dad maybe was a pirate, or maybe his dad was a smuggler, or maybe his dad was just a merchant captain. So that gives him a set of skills. He knows how to tie ropes. He knows how to swim. Um, he knows how to haggle because he's a merchant. So that kind of fighter could be a different look to him, the way he's dressed. Maybe he has a shash, a red shash, or he wears light armor or no armor, um, the kind of weapons, like a curved saber, you know, the kind of blades that they use on a ship. And they, uh, maybe he's got a... It also informs you in the kind of missile weapons they, they prefer, too, based on their background. Or maybe you're just a guard at the city or in a village, small village. Maybe your father was a guard at the local city or the local village, and he trained you or taught you to, uh, to be part of the militia. So I can see a new character because in, one of the, in, the, B2, in the B2 module, Keep on the Borderlands, um, in the newer version, uh, they, the local militia is made up of 14-year-olds and up. As soon as you're 14, I think they do that in Village of Hamlet too. As soon as you're 14, you're, you're enrolled into the militia and you're trained. You're trained to help defend the village. Uh, basic training, of course. Uh, you're trained, uh, you know, you're probably pretty much no more trained than in a, a pitchfork or a spear. But, you know, you start off that way as a character, your background. And then you've done that enough to get you to first level in your backstory, right? And now that you're first level, you want to get out of here. You know, all those backstories they can think of, like, I don't want to be in the small village anymore. This is nowhere. I want to be a great hero someday. Or, or some tragic story. Your father was killed or, what, or your village was burned to the ground. Whatever. But this is actually informing you of your background, the kind of fighter you are. Okay, I've got another little twist for you. What if you're a fighter of the church, a monastery? You know, just because somebody's from a monastery or a church doesn't mean they're a monk or they're a cleric or a paladin. Far from the truth. A lot of those guys are fighters. You know, the ones that guard the bishop or guard any kind of clergy missions, uh, deliveries from one church to another, because they're fairly mobile. The, you know, they're, the church is fairly active. Depending on the god they worship, they're fairly active. You know, they got things happening around the realm in, in the Viscounty. And so that could be a legitimate reason why you're a fighter and why they trained you as a fighter. And you, your first level, and then you think maybe something dramatic happened to get you into a, a role of being an adventurer. Uh, or maybe you're sent on a mission, another good reason, to start a campaign. The church says, okay, we have an invested interest here. We need to send some people. I want to find out what's happening. Because you remember the church, the bishops, they're vying for control because St. Cuthbert, the bishop, is the legitimate, is the official church of the Viscounty. And of course, all the other churches, which there are many, they all, they're all vying for the same position. They want the, they want the attention of the Council of Lords, they want the attention of the other lords, and of course, the Viscount himself. So this is all political reasons why uh, one of the churches would, would send somebody on some sort of mission, whatever your campaign is, like the Temple of Elemental Evil. Uh, and, and it gives them like a plot hook at the beginning of the campaign. They give them like a, to draw them in, to give them reason for being, give them more than a reason than just, hey, we got together on the road and now we're heading to the village of Hamlet looking for adventure. 
Okay, so we're going to go ahead and look at the character here. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, this is uh, the gnarly forest. Welkwood is to the south and the wild coast. So I, I, I was asking him where he wanted to be, and he wanted to be some kind of, someplace kind of exotic, someplace a little different. Uh, he wanted to be a little bit of a stranger to this land, to the Vi County. I said, okay, well, you can be from anywhere. So I gave him some choices. I described briefly these different areas around, and he chose the Wild Coast. And there's his character in World Anvil. His name is Vigon Dracora, Dracaro, the second. Um, Vigon, sorry, I have to look at the screen while I'm talking to you. Uh, he's, tra he's trained as a mercenary fighter and a guard. You know, that's why he decided on with my help. Because he doesn't know the campaign. I have to help him with this stuff. All right, so he has a personal history. So we came up with this together. He picked that picture out of himself. Vigon is what you would call an accident. A bastard son of a noble house in Narwell, in the northern, safer lands of the Wild Coast. He actually wrote this. I just remembered. I gave him some articles like from the Wild Coast, and he actually pieced this together. Then I helped him flush it out and finish it. His father, I had to come up with the Baron. I actually I got that from the Living Greyhawk series. Uh, his father, Baron Janston, the ruler of Narwell, is a wealthy noble and never knew of his birth. His mother, a baker who fell in love with a young noble, knowing that their love would never be allowed. She also knew that if Vigan's father ever found out about him and his life would be at risk. So at the age of two, Vigan was given over to an apprenticeship of a sword master. His name was Tevada. On the outskirts of a small thorpe north of Safetown, in the border of the gnarly forest in a small cottage, Vigan would spend the next 16 years of his life. So let's go ahead and look at that. And let me go ahead and bring up the map of, again of the gnarly forest. And what we're talking about is Narwell. So let's go ahead and zoom in. And I believe I placed him just to the northwest. So I think right where it says Camp Adderlorn, I think I put him where the letter P was. Normally I would place an object on my map to, for the characters. I always add uh, more. Uh, I always add more content in the campaign on the maps for the characters, but in this case, I didn't do it. I guess I just didn't have time. But that's where he's located at. He's brash. He's cocky. He's short-tempered. Uh, he generally travels alone, but when he does, he travels in a group, and it's generally to benefit himself. Uh, he came up with that himself, too. So let's continue about his background here. Okay, so down below, it looks like I copied the same paragraph, so I'll skip that. Um, for years... Vigan never even touched a blade, but Tevada instilled in him at a young age that he must be a master of the mind before he can master the blade. The blade is only an extension of the wielder. Be the master of your mind, and the blade will follow. At the age of 14, Vigan finally was given to his first training sword. From that point forward, it never left his side. For four years, Vigan trained 12 hours a day with a blade. At the age of 18, his master told him his training was done. And that's the um, cottage that he was raised in. On the right-hand side, um, he's 20 years old here. Uh, he's got a quote that we came up with. Insanity is law in a land driven by chaos. Or, I'm going to stop you right there. The only type of prophecy I believe in, I do a job, I get paid. Now get to the point. And we got some session reports, and he's a human. And right in the start of the campaign, he's at Packard's Trough B16 in the in the city of Urbabunk. So finally, he said, there's nothing left for me to teach you. He still had to finish two more years of duty for his master and was instructed that his last assignment was to guard a wealthy noble, a merchant of great importance, from divers. For over a year it seemed to fly by until late one night. Uh, let me go ahead and show you uh, divers real quick. So uh, this is where his little cottage is where the letter P is, Camp Adorlon. And if we scroll up, we'll see that divers is right here. The free city of divers. And this is the lands of divers. And this red line is the borders. So it does extend a little bit into the gnarly forest. On the right-hand side of this border is Greyhawk, and on the left side of this border, um, to the north of the river is Firandi, and south of the river over here is 
Verbabank, sorry. So this red border right here on the left of that border is Verbabank. Okay, so let's go back down to his little camp here and back to his character sheet. And go back to his character sheet. Vigan heard a scuffle in the, in the next room where the merchant was fast asleep. And the, then a blood-gurgling scream. Vigan burst through the door. The noble was sprawled out on the bed with a dagger struck through his chest. He scanned the room and there in the window was a figure all in black. And I went ahead and I added a picture of a knight and his squire because I figured, you know, that would kind of match. So as you can see here in his character sheet, it says, the figure in black says this to him, the Scarlet Brotherhood sends their regards. He failed his master. He knew at this point that his name would forever be tarnished and would be hard pressed to find work. He, just, he decided to make a visit to his master, but to his disbelief, his master was no longer to be seen. The cottage that was once called home was vacant, condemned even. It appeared that if no one has lived there for quite some time, also on the screen is the heraldry of Narwhal, of the Wild Coast. It was at this time that Vigan's life truly began. He vowed that he would never allow himself to be to fail again. He set off in the direct He set off the direction didn't matter. Vigan drifted north to Divers, a city for active mercenary work. He found a merchant that needed guards heading across Thurandi along the Great Western Road. And if I clicked on that, it'll take me to that article, but that's what the Great Western Road is. It connects um, Greyhawk going all the way west. It's one of the biggest merchant roads in the Flanes. Where he found himself in the fabled city of Verbabank. Add a little picture of caravan. He wandered the streets in wonder at the gnome and elven architecture and found himself at the Packard's Trough Inn. Popular with mercenaries, he enrolled into the Adventurer's Guild, B26, checking the postings daily, hoping to get a break in his journey. So he's got, he's got a motivation, revenge on his father. So he wants to find out what happened. So that's going to be a plot hook for later on in the campaign. So I could inter intertwine that into the campaign that probably has something to do with the Temple of Elemental Evil and slavers of the Wild Coast. So here's his character sheet. Is chaotic good? Um, he's level three right now in the campaign. I think he's got 24 hit points. Uh, he's got an elven longsword that he found. He's got a whip. That's right. He just bought that whip. He's in love with that thing. I let him. I give him a chance to pull people off their feet when he uses it. They have to make a strength check to break free, or they get they get, or they get knocked prone. And then he's got a green tipped spear, which is a, another item you got from a dungeon, and a blue steel sword, which is another item he looted from the dungeon. So he's pretty happy about that stuff. Uh, his stats: sixteen strength, fourteen dexterity, fifteen constitution, ten intelligence, thirteen wisdom. 13 Charisma. Yeah, he didn't roll too badly with this character. Not doing badly at all. Okay, let's go back to uh, the city of Verbabank. So at the beginning of this campaign, that was his backstory. But at the beginning of the campaign, he's in Packard's Trough in the city of Verbabank. So let's go ahead and zoom in and find out where that is. It's along on the boulevard here, the bridge walk. That's the bridge. And the bridge walk boulevard is the street that runs uh, north and south through Verbabank. And right there, Pack Backwards Trove. So I went over this location with the ranger in the group in a previous video because the ranger from the Gnarly Forest, um, he's half orc and he's trying to keep a low profile in it while he's in the city. And he has a reason why he's here. You have to watch that video for that. But he's staying also at the Packers Trough. So I, I assume that those two probably kind of made friends while they're both staying here. Uh, the Packers Trough is a pl place for mercenary work, and I figure that's a great place for both of them to be from. So, so let's go ahead and take a look here. Uh, I'll, I'll just do a quick review because this has already been explained in the other video. But um, I have descriptions of inside and outside, and a whole bunch of NPCs fully detailed with maps of maps on, on the bottom floor, or top floor, or middle floor. Um, I have. Um, information about the Packard's bandit gang story. There's a story about this bandit gang that's there uh, with dialogue. So that way, if they do talk to them, they get to know them a little bit, they could find out some information about them. Um, 
if they talk to Packard himself, he's got a whole backstory. He's from Divers. So right then, right there is a connection between um, Vigan and Packard. They can talk about it because they share that together. So they can, he, um, Vigan can learn something about Packard. Um, he can actually maybe develop a friendship there or some kind of connection in the campaign to follow up on later. You know, maybe he can go there for aid or information or something um, if he knows him well enough. So he gets to know him there. Um, then I got uh, information up. And then I also described the, the concubine maiden, the madame, and um, the serving girls, the working girls that work there. And they got their own story. One of them was an orphan from the streets of Divers. So she's got a backstory too. Um, I got the bouncer here in case there's a bar fight. He's fully statted out. Um, there's some thieves and bandits playing tonk you know, on one of the tables. And they're, ha they're bantering back and forth. You know, having a conversation, so I I can throw that in there when I start role playing this the scene, this encounter, this location. Um, if he decides to join the card game, I have dialogue pre written to start me off role playing in that, um, and I try to keep the gambling fast. I just have him make dexterity checks, intelligence checks. Um, I could do actually play Farkle from Kingdom Come, the video game. I got a, all the rules for that, but it takes too long at the table. And you got all these other players at the table just sitting there watching you, so it doesn't really work out. So I just do the simple stat roll. And then um, if a thief assassin comes into the bar looking for one of the players, um, I have a description of that. It's usually the bad guy sending them in to give them a message. Um, then we have got fully statted out bandits they can talk to with backstories and personalities in case I need them. I always want, want to be prepared. And so prepared that I got a menu on the right hand side, the price of drinks and meals and how much it costs to stay there. Uh, so, and then another thing I want to point out was the Adventurers Guild. Adventurers Guild is by the waterfront along the Velvet Iver River. And there we go. I, I reviewed this already in the last two videos with the wizard and the ranger, actually the ranger. So you might want to watch the ranger video about the Adventurers Guild, but really quick, um, this has got descriptions of the place and the goods and services they provide. It costs 10 gold pieces a month to join the guild. Um, and, it, and it talks about how there's a posting there where mercenaries are looking for work or, or adventuring groups or lords or mer rich merchants are looking for workers, uh, guards or or, or people to do some jobs. This is a place to, it's like a clearinghouse for jobs. It's like a LinkedIn for adventurers <laughs> and mercenaries and caravan guards. And they also have a, a messenger service to, um, so wherever you're staying in the city, they can send a messenger with a new job pops up that costs, that's a fee for that. And it's all pretty cool, you know, because you gotta remember the Viscounty of the Verbabank, the city of Verbabank is one of the more modern cities of the Flaness. There's only so many of them, and this would be one of them. And I figured it had these kind of amenities available to the players, even though I do try to limit my magic in the game. Okay, so we have a backstory for this character. Um, he's, he has a plot hook. A few of them, actually. Um, he's at Packard's Inn. He talks to Packard, talks to some of the bandits, he gets to know them. In fact, he might recognize a few of them later in the campaign because the bad guys hire from there too. So it'd be kind of funny or interesting that after a battle, you know, he recognizes a few of them. Uh, so anyway, he meets Ura, the ranger there, and they become friends. And so when I have um, pre-encounters in this campaign before the party gets together, so session one in this campaign is called Noble Ambitions from Living Greyhawk. It's the very first module set in the Viscounty of Riverbank, and it deals with the gnome troubles. Um, the lords um, are up to no good from greed or self-indulgence or self-interest, and the Viscount himself has his hands full to deal with them, and because some of them get into trouble, and uh, some of them are trying to the gem, silver, and gold mines from the gnomes to the south in the Crown Hills. So lately, when it comes to politics, the Viscount actually pulled back the mounted borderers from patrolling the Cron Hills. They were protecting the merchant, merchant caravans coming from the Cron Hills, the free assembly of gnomes. So the gnome clans were sending caravans north to the Viscount for trade to sell their gold, the gems, and the silver. Well, lately, since the mounted borderers have been pulled back, they've been raided regularly. And in fact, uh, two of the mounted border guards that were in the area at the time got attacked by a whole band of gnomes and a hill giant. 
and those two are the two wounded are actually right currently when this campaign starts they're at St. Cuthbert the chapel of St. Cuthbert being tended by the bishop under orders of the viscount so the ranger gets that tip that lead and he'll probably ask Vigon to join him and the two of them go together to St. Cuthbert to, to investigate this attack because the the Urad has a vested interest of what's going on. The Gnarly Rangers and the Elven clans of the Gnarly are have their hands full because right lately an entire more band of ogres and orcs have traveled from, from the south, like from Welkwood, into the Gnarly Forest, and it's just too much for them to handle. And also, with all the activity of the raids that are happening in the Kron Hills, which blend in with the Gnarly Forest, the mounted borderers have been pulled back. And so now there's the raids are ramping up, and they're at a loss. The, Gnarly, the people of the Gnarly Forest are have their hands full, and the gnomes are really upset. And um, they've got a couple of gnomes, Prince Jim, and another councillor, they're on the they're on the Council of Lords. They were allowed access. They were, they, were, they were allowed to be on the Council of Lords when they helped fight at the Battle of Emerald Meadows. And ever since then, they had a say in politics in the Viscounty of Verbabank. But right now, there's been a lot of in the last session. There was a lot of accusations thrown back and forth, and they legitimately believe that the Lords are trying to steal their minds, and they don't they don't feel wanted in the city in, city anymore. They're not wanted in the city anymore, and all their caravans are being raided, and they're blaming the humans for that. So there's a lot of fighting in the inns, on the streets, um, different in, in, in meetings that they have, and it's a really bad situation right now. And so if you ask any human or gnome in the city of Verbabank, they all have their opinion. And in the last video, I did go over um, all these different rumors that you could share with the players when they actually see or hear a fight or an argument. And, or they question somebody about something, like questioning them about what happened to the mounted borderers. Um, everybody has an opinion. And so it's up to the players to figure this all out, you know, who's causing all this. And it, which, of course, is the bad guys. They're pulling strings. There's a, they're, because the Temple of the Mental Evil doesn't exist in a vacuum. They've got to have help from outside to keep their activities unnoticed because they need a lot of supplies. They need slaves. They need uh, fodder for their undead and their uh, sacrifices, sacrificial rights and they have a lot of recruiting of monsters and npcs like bandits and they have to feed them they have to pay them so it's a lot of resources they need to support this this endeavor of the temple of elemental evil that's on the rise and so they need help from the big cities like divers and verbabunk and the wild coast with the slavers and so the players will get wind of some of this stuff but they don't really know who's behind it and um, the assassins go after Prince Jim. Assassins go after the party eventually. Um, the different temples and the Temple of Elemental Evil are up to no good. Out, you know, like what, what's going on at the Moat House? That's just one outpost. There's like four more out there. Um, yeah, Gary Gygax says in this module that there should be four more outposts or more out there in the area. And the new module from Wizards of the Coast actually. Um, they actually created this, so I'm using it. And so they have the Earth Temple, Earth, Water, Fire, and Air. They have their own outpost out there and with their own NPCs. It's great. And they have their own activities, and they're, all, and they're, and they're escalating. And the party will start coming across this stuff and having to, to deal with it. So the, uh, the political bad guys, they're, they're the forces that are helping the Temple of Elemental Evil, they're in the Vi County you know they're in the city and they're in divers and they're actually pulling strings to make this stuff happen and that they actually the players will actually see this in session one when this module kicks off so this module kicks off is lady osbury lady eleanor puts out a notice she needs help so lady baroness eleanor osbury and she's an ambassador of the celestial circle and she's mistress of house osbury and her house needs help something happened besides the two mounted borderers that have been attacked Things are happening now. New Moon's glory is happening in seven days, which is a big festival in the Viscounty. A lot of things are shaking up. Besides the Mount of Borders being pulled back, the gnome caravans being raided, the war band, the huge 500-man orc band of ogres and orcs coming from the south up to the Gnarly and taking over the ancient Sul Temple and planning raids into the Viscounty. All that stuff has got to be dealt with by these players and it starts off here so the first thing that they find out campaign started is uh the two players they get they find this notice at the adventurers guild this notice goes up on the post there 
And so they go, oh, this looks like a great opportunity to get involved, to make some serious coin and to become famous, to, be, to maybe to gain favor or get uh, help, assistance with the problems at hand, or maybe this noble knows something. So this is a good way to get close. They always say, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. And who knows what the nobles are up to. And something's happening and it's not good. And so the players are trying to figure this out. And a good way to get close to the lords is take on a quest from one of them. And so this is uh, actually saying to meet at Jiley's Inn that night when the campaign starts. If you go up north or to the south, this map's backwards. Again, I have to keep saying that. Uh, this is the south wall going into the Viscounty. And Jiley's Inn is right there, C3, which is a civil court. Uh, by the civil court building C2. And of course, that's the big chapel, the big um, cathedral of Trithran. So the party has to get there eventually. The background story of all the characters brings them or places them in the city of Urbibank. And then the couple of side quests that I have them do individually before session one starts brings them to Jolly's End. And then when they all arrive at that time at the inn, that's when they all of them meet at the, at, for the first time. Some of them know each other before this, like the ranger and the fighter. So if we look at the map and we go across town here, so this right here is the old Temple of St. Cuthbert because the new Temple of St. Cuthbert, a bigger one, is being built across the city by the market square. So the two players, the fighter and the ranger, are going to find themselves heading this way. And actually, the wizard, Mascus, in my other video, um, his... Um, master ordered him to come here too to investigate because all the power players in this city um, are trying to uh, get favor with the court the court of lords and the viscount and when they hear something they want to get involved and see if they can't be of help and uh, they all end up here and they witness uh, the interrogation or the questioning of the two mounted guards and they question bishop hoffren and then that uh, riot appears then a riot occurs at the front of the chapel when they're done and that's a huge escalation against the gnomes, which is actually quite exciting and funny. If you want to, if you want to review that, you need to look at my last video because I actually talk about that quite a bit. I don't want to repeat myself here. So when the two players get here, um, they're going to follow the riot uh, southwards, but it's still too early to go to Jolly's. So when they get down to on uh, the boulevard down here, um, they're going to come across a couple gnomes arguing with a merchant, and I talked about that in the last video too. So they're going to witness firsthand the, how the gnomes are being treated. Huge argument between uh, a merchant at the jewelry store and merchant traders, gnome traders from um, Tuvar, uh, one of the clans that did business with them, and they're being ripped off. So let's go back to Vigon. So before Vigon did any of this, um, I wanted to give him a side mission. I want to get all the player. I want to give all the players something special, some kind of cool hook. Because I gave one to the wizard. I talked a lot about that in my last video. He got that whole thing with the amulet and the book and you know the necromatic castle he has to go find. So I want to give one to the fighter. I want to make the fighter feel special. You know, he's just a fighter. He needs something, right? I want him to feel special and cool. So guess what? I came up with a great one. So I got these side adventures from a thing called Sarge of the City. I'll share that with you on screen here. Um, it's just a PDF that I bought off of uh, drivethroughrpg.com. And um, it, was, it was a whole guide full of adventures and sites around the city. And I pepper these sites around the city while I'm role playing with the characters. As they're walking through town, I'll throw in a little descriptors like, you know, what the buildings look like and trash in the alley and some old man in the streets poking with a stick at some trash and cackling to himself. Yeah, I always throw a little bit of that in there and also the weather. And of course the towering uh, spire, the towering spires of the Cathedral of Trithorin. And they and the tr actually I have an encounter there too because it's God's day. And so all the churches are busy. All the, all the bells are gonging, they're ringing, they're all having parades, they're having ceremonies inside and outside. And the Cathedral of Trithorin are not to be uh, dismissed. In fact, they're the loudest. It carries on throughout the entire city and drowns out almost all the other bells. You know, much to the consternation of the other churches. You know, it's kind of a little bit of a thing there, a little bit of a rub. So they're having this parade of um, recruits out front. And that, that's a whole other thing that we're role playing. It's something that the players witness as they're walking by towards Jolly's Inn. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about something I have for the fighter. So I have this thing called On a Mission from God, which is the name of the uh, mission, the adventure that's in that uh, Sarge 
uh, PDF that I bought. So I kind of reworded it and I, re and I added it to the city. So I had to rewrite quite a bit of it. So I have a plot hook. Uh, Elfwin is the character here, a protagonist, and she's about to begin a mission to carry a special item from the city. Um, the noble quest line, I got her tied into that. And then I have descriptions of what's happening here. So let's go ahead and look at her real quick. So that's her. Go ahead and take a look at Elfwin. Uh, she's a confident priestess. Her name's Elfwin. Uh, she's a half-elf foundling who grew up in the temple and has never known serious disapproval or hardship. She has been of assistance in some missions for the temple and about to be sent on a mission of her own. She wears a thin gold circlet on her brow and the tips of her pointed ears peek through her braided hair, evidence of elven blood mixed with a human heritage. A gold ring with a blue stone adorns one of the hands she clasps in front of her chest. Around her neck on the leather cord hangs a holy symbol of polished wood. It looks slightly out of place with the rest of her regalia. All right, so we have her. She's a, you know, NPC. So let's go back to the mission here. Now let's go back to the mission. This is what happens. So we're role playing. He's making himself, he's making his way through the city. He's probably on his way to, uh, from Packard's Inn or something. And so I'll throw this in there. Oops. Uh, so the first thing that happens when the player gets the bridge walk which is Packard's Inn is on bridge walk by the way so this is really easy to throw in as he's leaving or coming in or something he sees this this is this is a scene that he actually witnesses the ringing of small bells catches your attention over the noise of the crowd he goes oh what's going on others standing around become excited you hear people exclaim they're coming back I'm going to stand on the temple steps so I can get a good view of the procession. Uh, Bridgewalk Road is a major thoroughfare from the south gate to the new temple of St. Cuthbert. But there's plenty of steps enough to get a better view. People arrange themselves so that a clear path runs along the street to the temple. Uh, what do you do? And he says, oh, I'll get to the side of the street. I stand on one of the steps. I, I don't want to get in the way. I just want to see. So that's what he did. He just went to the side of the road and just watched. So it's perfect. This is what you see. You see two pairs of acolytes in white surplices over black robes. They come around the corner carrying frames with bells strung on wires. They shake the frames with each measured step, providing a rhythmic jingling accompaniment to the progress of the group. Behind them are four priests in black, chanting in unison. You can't make out the words. Perhaps they are in some ancient language of the priest's religion? But the tones are harmonious. He's still waiting? Yep. Let's see what happens. Next come four more priests in red and golden censures. The scent of burning incense reaches you, and the spicy odor tickles your nostrils pleasantly. The cloud of smoke that they're putting up is impressive. In the middle is, is a serenely walking a single priestess. Her robe is white with a shaft of gold and her beautiful face bears an exalted expression as if she communes with another plane of existence. Following her down the street are four more acolytes with bells stepping along in a dignified manner with serious expressions on their young faces. What do you do? Okay, I wait for them to go by. Do I notice anything different about them? That's what he's asking me. I go, well, this is what happens. Uh, the progression uh, passes nearby, and you get a good look at the, all the participants. The acolytes, what you noticed, are boys and girls, now that you look closely. They're about 10 years of age. Their arms seem to be getting tired, judging by how some of the sets of bells are drooping. But they keep the rhythm going regardless. One of the chanting priests, you notice that he's frowning in concentration. Another has his eyes on the temple ahead, while another looks completely bored, though his voice does not falter. The priestess who is in focus of the procession moves with sure steps. Her eyes are raised. At this proximity, you notice something that you see a thin gold circlet on her brow, and the tips of pointed ears are peeking through her braided hair. Evidence of elven blood mixed in her human heritage. A gold ring with blue stone adorns one of the hands she clasps in front of her chest. Around her neck on a leather cord hangs the holy symbol of a blank, serene white face of polished wood. And I'd make a roll 
See, he wouldn't know what god that was. He's just a fighter from the Wild Coast, so he has no idea. But to let you know, that's the god of Rayo, the god of, god of serenity and peace. So it looks slightly out of place with the rest of her regalia. And he goes, cool. <laughs> so he waits for them to go by. He just wanted to see if he noticed anything different. Well, as she passes you, the priestess unexpectedly comes to a complete stop. So right now the player is freaking out. Really? One of the bell carriers behind, behind her runs into her with a jingle. But she seems not to notice. Instead, the cleric turns. Her brilliant blue eyes are fixed directly on you. <laughs> so he's like, what's going on here? Before he can react, he's about to say, I'm going to step back or try to get behind the crowd. He's about to say that. So you know what? Stepping quickly forward, before you could react, past the onlookers in front of you, she addresses you very excitedly. At last, I have found you! We must talk. Come, follow the procession to the temple, and we can make plans. When the priestess starts speaking, the forward part of the procession finally realizes that all is not going smoothly and comes to a complete halt. And so he says, uh, I forgot what he said. He said something like, what plans are you talking about? I don't know you. <laughs> and so I finally respond again to what he just said. And I said, we may not, we may not have met, but Rael knows you and my mission. We have been brought together, you and I. Come! The woman gives a confident nod and moves back into formation. So he's really confused. And she calls out, Carry on! To the acolytes in front, and the procession moves forward again. Though not quite in unison as it achieved before the interruption. They walk down the bridge walk road and to a side street into the high quarter. So at this point, I ask him, you know, what are you going to do now? So he's, a little, he's at a loss. He doesn't know. He's really freaking out about this. He didn't expect this. You know, he's a 5e player. So uh, he had a choice. He can either, like, keep going to uh, the chapel of St. Cuthbert or Jolly's Inn, depending where it was in the day. Continue where he was going. I think it was, oh, that's right. He was on his way to um, the Adventurers Guild. So he hasn't got the note yet. So before he got the note, he decided to follow her. So uh, so he follows the procession. You know, he stays a little bit back into the main square of the towering Cathedral of Trithran. The progression then turns, ascending towards the high walls of Greyfist Castle. Before the main drawbridge, the slow parade turns aside to the east of the mighty walls and approaches the Monastery of the Reverend Brothers and climb the steps into the temple disappearing into the shadows inside the great door, which remains open behind them. At this point, you've got to decide, okay, am I going to try to get into this place and follow her and ask her some questions, or maybe just leave? So he decided to keep going. So um, he follows, he noticed that he's also another, uh, he also notices that a group of watchers also followed as well. You know, maybe possible new recruits because this is Holy High Holy Day, and that's what the churches do. They have these par they have these parades, that they have these ceremonies, and they try to recruit new worshippers. Oftentimes, they offer free food or healing or whatever to get the recruit new worshippers. And so, there's a number of people following behind him as well. Okay, so approaching the entrance, he no So I tell the player, you notice that there's a gray-robed acolyte on the left that gives you an opening, accepting nod. You notice his calm manner bellies, belies the visage of the symbol of Rayo amulet around his neck. With agreeable calmness, he asks, your arrival among the reverent brothers is most welcome. What is the purpose of your visit today? <laughs> so the player is like, hmm. So the player says, I'm here to uh, be recruited or something like that, just to get in. So with introspective and thoughtfulness, the accolade finally answers him. Past the Tower of Reason is the assembly hall of the Reverend Brothers. You are most welcome to attend the ceremony of peace and reason. Please, I ask to respect the I ask you to respect the sanctity of the monastery. May the peace 
reason, and serenity of Rao fulfill you. And at that point, it's probably when he learned that it's the god of Rao. So the acolyte nods once again and spreads his hands out to his sides in prayer of meditation. So that allows him in. So he walks past the Tower of Reason to the Grand Assembly Hall of the Reverend Brothers. It's a stunning stained glass, high art ceiling grace the congregation. The scent of meditative incense drifts heavy from the mass of gilded doors. The incense seems to ride the current of heavy chanting of the ceremony taking place within the hollowed hall. Two more gray-robed acolytes are positioned on each side of the doorway, nodding in acceptance to each of the worshippers they enter. So he'll ask that, and then he'll ask to be let in, and then, of course, that acolyte will answer as well. Please enter and take a seat here in the assembly of the Hall of Reverend Brothers. You are most welcome to attend the ceremony of peace and reason. Please, I ask to respect the sanctity of the, made the peace, reason, and serenity of Rael. You know, same thing. So spreads his hand, prayer, lets him in. So entering the hall, the people following the progression file themselves in to the many views that lie in the hall. They all take seats. Taking seats, bow their heads to the chanting of the priest at the altar. You take your seat near the... So he decides to take a seat near the back as the chanting reverberates deeply within the arched walls and ceiling. As the sound booms in your head, the incense seems to flood your mind and carry away all, carry away all your troubles and concerns. You feel like you would need to focus sharply to keep the meditative effects from fogging your mind. So at that point, he says, I take my uh, cloak and I put it around my face and I breathe through the cloth. So um, I lessen the effects of that incense on him. He was really freaked out by this, by the way. He, he kept thinking he was going to be brainwashed. At the front of the hall is a massive dais uh, mounted by a gold gilded altar lined with tallow candles. Each member of the procession steps up to the altar, places the candle on one, of, by one, one by one on the altar. An enormous sculpture of the face of Rayo hangs on the soaring wall behind the altar. As each candle is placed, the visage emanates a divine glow that basks the altar and the assemblage. Rayo's divine glory mounting to embrace all that who pray. As the last candle is placed, an elder priest steps to the alt- up to the altar wearing a cowled blue-gray robe trimmed in white and gold. Rayo's symbol is emblazed on his chest. Now I created this, I wrote this uh, sermon. I just took a sermon and I rewrote it to fit the campaign. So I started off with some uh, Latin to make it sound cool. Um, then it goes on about, this is some of the um, verse from Rayo, the God, you know, the beliefs. If you go to, um, read the article on Rayo, a lot of these words are in that article. So I kind of rewrote it to be a sermon. So I, I recite this for role-playing purposes. And the player is sitting there, li- sitting there listening to this, trying to keep the fogginess out of his mind, trying to breathe through his cloth. So... Be still and know that I am Rayo and those minds. I usually do it in a very deep voice, a booming deep voice, very solemn and serious. El quiramentis sent steadfastly fixum in Rayo. Now I just continue that and I end it. So at the end of the ceremony, the high priest raises his cowl and steps off the dais to walk with a slow measured steps back to the hall and disappears into the monastery. The worshippers all rise and make their way out of the hall, appearing out of no. So at that point, I, you know, the player's going, okay, I'm going to leave. <laughs> so I'm going to make my way to the door. Well, appearing out of the meditative induced incense, Elfwin whispers calmly in your ear with a sense of excited urgency to follow her to the halls of peace. She straightens up, takes on this calm, serene demeanor that all the other acolytes seem to possess and walk with measured steps out the doors of the hall. Player's super freaking out. Get to remember, this is a new player. It's just playing a fighter. (laughs) Because I'm not a cleric. What's going on here? So he's following Elfwyn. They reach the monastery courtyard. Her route takes a left to a large, standalone, four-sided stone building with the words engraved over the top. Halls of Peace. You enter the library. It's a library-like quiet hall with stairs on either end that the Brotherhood obviously has their accommodations. 
Here in the Great Hall are dozens of tables with chairs laden with food and drink. Other acolytes have led their worshippers that are being recruited to follow that followed the procession earlier to the tables to discuss doctrine of Rayo and the partake of the banquet. I'm trying to bribe them to join up. So anyway, Alfwyn pulls you to the side, pulls the character to the side to speak her mind. I've been selected by my order to organize a mission to retrieve the holy relic of Rayo. The temple is trying to keep the mission and also the loss of the relic quiet as it, to, as it brings shame upon the reverent, reverent brothers. Rayo himself came to me in a vision. He speaketh unto me. Find your lost brother, for his madness can only reason lead to peace. Seek the crown of the flaming sword and the shining gem. Beseeks the eight mighty ones. But, but the face of Rael was not of him, but of your visage. My thoughts is that Rael's chosen prophet must walk the finesse once again. My order, then learned of my vision, is immensely concerned for the times that Rael's prophets have walked in our lands and for times of strife and incumbent consternation for the brothers of Rayo. Some in my order rally, railed their doubts that my fond vision is distracted conceit, fable of a young girl's mind. She sows a look of distrust and betrayal. So the rest of this is just more dialogue for a little bit later because at this point, I, he, the player has questions. And so I'm ready to answer some of these questions. So he'll ask a series of questions like, what's going on? Why, who, why is it my face he saw? What's going on here? You know, and he has this attitude because you saw his background, the kind of character he is. So he's being kind of really cool, you know. He's being he's being himself. He's role playing pretty well. I was really impressed. Her only answers were like, "I understand that the union of deep feeling with profound thought, the fine balance of truth, and observing the imaginative faculty and modifying the objects observed, or reason is immortal, all else is immortal. If thou hast not further questions, I will withdraw. You know, so you'll have these canned answers sometimes when, when her, um, say there's, I don't have an exact direct answer to his question, but she'll keep focusing on her dream. That's his visage that she saw, not Rayo, and so keep repeating that uh, as a prophet walking the earth, that he's the prophet that's returned to the finesse, and and they're gonna he's gonna be the one to, to um, fetch back the treasure of Rayo, the lost chest of Rayo, which has been taken. So that's a whole quest. And that quest is the actual quest linked to what Lady Eleanor needs. She's wanting her treasures of House Osbury back. And with that treasure is the chest of Rayo, which was stolen by that raid. So it all comes together nicely. It fits really well, the how I put, put this all together. And it gives this player a, a hook into the campaign that's personal, that draws him in. And it's really freaking him out. And he keeps talking about it throughout the campaign. I'm the frozen one. I'm the prophet. <laughs> He's just a fighter, right? So um, then she finally tells him, after further research from our large library, I was able... Okay, so if he goes back. I'm sorry. If he goes back to her, she'll, tell her, she'll, she'll do some research and she'll tell him. You know, after further research from the large library, I was able to discover the reference to Seek the crown of the flaming sword and the shining gem. Tis the herald of House Osbury. I do not have much knowledge of nobility, but I do know that House Osbury is a large holding in the Viscounty to the south. As to the reference to the eight mighty ones, I do not know of, nor of the uncouth passage, find your lost brother for his madness. I do not understand that. That's beyond me. Then so also comment, with thou discovery today, the order has given me license to intercourse with yourself to investigate the recovery of the lost relic. I saw manifest any questions that you hold dear. So I got this all stuff written, ready to go, so when I can use it while they're talking to her. Because that stuff is really hard to come up with, you know, on the spur of the moment without it being written out. So I'm ready to go. And uh, he's like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, so he doesn't really know what any of this stuff means either, right? He hasn't even met Lady Osbury yet, Lady Eleanor. So first he's got to go talk to her. And that's going to be in a future video. In a future video on session one, all the players finally get to the first encounter, which is meeting of Lady Eleanor Osbury and her quest and her invitation to join her mission to recover the lost relics of house osbury so i hope you like everything i had to talk about today 
Um, so this video is about one player in my campaign, and I'm planning to make some more of my other players. I This is my third one. And I'll probably just make one more about the cleric, because he's got the side quest before he meets the rest of the players, too. If you have any comments, please leave them below. I know my orcs would like to talk to you, too, about any uh, questions you might have for them. Did you enjoy video? Consider tossing support on my Patreon. It best ways support orcs. If you would like to see more content, subscribe and post comments below. It better not be bad. You're welcome to go to my Patreon and to support me there. And that encourages me to make more videos like this. I know not too many people actually focus on just old school D&D and Greyhawk and the Viscounty and cult, um, the Temple of Elemental Evil. But I make these for you guys that need it, that like it, that's running this campaign. And um, I actually post these on my Patreon as well. So thank you so much. Good luck running your campaign. I hope your players have a lot of fun.